Welcome to the JDC New York 17 Candidate Forum. Good afternoon. My name is Susie Stern, and I am a New York-based board member of the Jewish Democratic Council of America, JDCA, and one of its founders. Congresswoman Nita Lowy's friendship with the Jewish community in New York and nationally and internationally is unmatched, and we are incredibly grateful for her leadership in Congress. And while we're sad to see her retire, we honor her incredible legacy in Congress. And we are excited to be joined by the seven candidates who are working tirelessly, literally tirelessly, to fill her very large shoes. Assemblyman David Buckwald, Asha Castleberry Hernandez, State Senator David Carlucci, Dr. Evelyn Farkas, Allison Fine, Mondaire Jones, and Adam Schleifer and we look forward to hearing from all of them today. Needless to say, these are critically important times, and I know all of you agree that our country depends on the leadership of those we elect to represent us in Washington. As a former neighbor of New York 17, I was in Nita's old district, I know how important this election will be, and I hope my fellow New Yorkers will carefully listen to all seven of the candidates, and of course, vote on or before the June 23rd primary. I also hope that all seven candidates will carefully listen to each other today and not engage in any back and forth or disparaging comments about each other. JDC is thrilled to hold, host this forum, but this is not a debate, it is a forum. Each question will be directed to all seven of you and your answers should be directed at the audience and not to each other. And now I thank you and I now return, turn it over to another JDC board member, formerly from Westchester, Karen Kasner. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Susie. Hi, my name is Karen Kasner, and I am a member of the board of JDCA, and as Susie said, also a former resident of New York 17. In the nearly three years since our founding, JDCA has established itself as a voice of Jewish Democrats, advocating for Jewish and democratic values and electing those who share our values. That's exactly what we did in 2018 when 84% of JDCA endorsed candidates won their race and we helped flip 28 seats from red to blue. In 2020, JDCA has already endorsed nearly 70 candidates and will continue to add to that list with the goal of increasing Democrats House, Democrats House majority, taking control of the Senate and electing Joe Biden. At this inflection point in American history, less than five months before the most important election of our lifetime, we face two crises, that of racial injustice and an ongoing pandemic. These crises have an underscored the critical importance of elections and the need to elect those who share our values in just 139 days. As we look to the general election, let us not forget about the primary, which is critically important in this race. As you know, in-person voting has already begun and you can request absentee ballots in person through June 22nd and as of election day, which is on June 23rd. With that, I'm happy to introduce you to our executive director, Haley Sofair, who will moderate today's forum. Prior to her work for JDCA, Haley worked for four members of Congress, including three senators, such as Senators Kamala Harris, Chris Coons, and on the campaigns, including the 2008 Obama presidential campaign, where she was the Florida Jewish Vote Director. Haley also served as a senior policy advisor to U.S. Ambassador to the United States, Samantha Power, and the Obama administration. For the past two years, Haley has led the, J, led the JDCA as our executive director, and I am thrilled she will be serving you this afternoon as our moderator. Over to you, Haley, and thank you. Thank you so much to Karen and Susie. I'm thrilled to moderate this panel, and even more thrilled to see so many great candidates running in this race. With the overwhelming number of candidates, we need rules to ensure this is controlled and equitable, and I will now re reveal those rules and go over them for the candidates. 
Candidates will have a minute and a half for introductory remarks. I will then ask the candidates to answer questions with the input of our audience. And you may send uh, questions to info at jewishdems.org. All questions will be directed at all seven candidates. Candidates will then have one minute and 30 seconds to answer each question, and we will alter the answer in which they, the order in which they answer. There will be no rebuttals, and as Susie mentioned, for the candidates, please do not direct your comments or answers at the other candidates. Please remember you are always addressing the audience. Last, we will end with one minute closing statements. Please do adhere to the rules regarding the time limits. We will sound an alarm when your time is up and you will also see a sign as we've discussed. Uh, with that ring, we would kindly ask that you complete your sentence. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to the seven candidates for their opening statements. With gratitude for the decades of leadership of Congresswoman Nita Lowy and her partnership with the Jewish community, we've asked our candidates to address in their opening statements how they will follow in her footsteps and continue this strong legacy of the strong relationship with the Jewish community. We will now start with the introductory statements in alphabetical order of the first names, starting with David B, David C, Asha, Evelyn, Allison, Mondaire, and then Adam. Uh, and I'm sorry if that was a confusing way of starting here, but we'll start with David B, followed by Asha, David C, Evelyn, Allison, Mondaire, and then Adam, and I'll let you know as we as we go along which order. So David B, please over to you. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to begin. I'll, I'll note that in my alphabet, uh, D is after A, but um, I guess you meant alphabetical by last name, uh, which is fine. Um, uh, the day Congresswoman Nita Lowy announced that she wasn't seeking re-election, I was standing with elected officials, clergy from all denominations, and other community leaders to, at Westchester County's Holocaust Memorial to uh, denounce the defacing of that memorial the night before. That was, that was just one incident of anti-Semitism in our region and in our country, and unfortunately others have been far more brutal and painful. We can't replace Nita Lowy, but we can send a serious policymaker to Washington. And like Lowy, someone who is a tested leader who understands the importance of the U.S.-Israeli relationship and will stand up to anti-Semitism, even when it's present in our Democratic Party. Congresswoman Lowy's legacy is built on getting things done and passing bills that actually make a difference in people's lives. I think back 20 plus years, just after I was an intern in her office, when Lowy successfully established 0.08 as the blood alcohol content required for drunk driving uh, infractions in this country. That accomplishment saved lives. I'm honored to be running for Congress to succeed her because I wanna live up to her legacy and build one of my own. I'm a New York State Assemblyman, a serious legislator who has passed over 70 bills into law. And I'm grounded in my faith and background as a Jew. My grandfather was one of 400 rabbis who marched on Washington in 1943 to ask President Roosevelt to save the Jews of Europe and increase the number of Jewish refugees entering the United States. Anti-Semitism, COVID-19, racial justice, the list of pressing challenges we face is truly daunting. It demands leaders in Washington who have the personal and political experience to tackle the challenges our country faces. I am ready. Thank you. Thank you for that. You were right. The order has been arranged by last name. So my apologies about any confusion there. We will now turn to, uh, to Asha. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, forum. I'm, I'm really excited to join here. And Haley, thank you so much. And I noticed you worked at the U.S. Mission to United Nations. I as well did under uh, Susan Rice. So what an honor. Um, again, my name is Asha Casper Hernandez, and I'm the one that's definitely ready on day one to uh, take on as, a, as Anita Lowy's successor. Why? Because I have the leadership and experiences. I understand uh, deeply how the local issues are passing many people in, in a diverse community, as well as I have a worldview, executive of foreign policy, national security, uh, and combat zones in places like Iraq, Syria, and Jordan, and helping to uh, provide security for the state 
of Israel and spoke about it uh, for two years as a commentator for I-24 News. So moving forward, as far as her legacy, she's all about getting the job done and I am the person. Uh, I support many uh, legacy initiatives that she has uh, taken on, such as Head, Head Start, which uh, you know I'm a mom to a three-year-old, so I'm in support of that. Security assistance to Israel, of course, as well as cultural assistance, combat and anti-Semitism, um, where we're seeing that she had recently called out the uh, swastikas that were on um, these German yard um, uh, yard area. So we have to continuously uh, work on that issue, and also supporting the idea of reinvigorating the two state um, negotiation of a two state solution. I think that is very important. So when when we're continuing her legacy, we have to not only look at um, making sure that we. The, the local issues, but local programs, but also her foreign policy and the that's done at the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you. And for the audience, uh, just so you know, we're going to have that, those chimes at the one minute and 30 second mark uh, to keep everyone on time. Okay, we will next go to David C. Good afternoon. I'm Senator David Carlucci, and I want to thank everyone for putting this event together. Thank all the candidates and everyone watching. Uh, again, like I said, I'm Senator David Carlucci, and I've had the distinct honor and privilege of representing the people of Rockland and Westchester counties in the New York State Senate, uh, now on my 10th year. And this past year, I was able to put more legislation on the governor's desk than any lawmaker in the state of New York. So we are losing a champion in Congress with the retirement of Congresswoman Nita Lowy. Congresswoman Lowy has been the chair of the Appropriations Committee and a staunch ally of Israel. And we have to continue that legacy. We have to make sure that the next member of Congress to step into the shoes of Nita Lowy has to be a staunch supporter of Israel and has to continue that fight. I have the privilege of representing Rockland County, which has the largest per capita uh, Jewish population of any county in the state in the country. And that has, I've seen and witnessed the rise of anti-Semitism and racism right here in our community. And I've stood up and fought to make sure that we push back against anti-Semitism. I've voted in favor in the New York State Legislature to stop and to not support the anti-BDS movement. We passed that in the New York State Legislature, something I look forward to doing in Congress. We've been pushing and I hope becomes law on the federal level is the never forget legislation to be proactive, to teach our children about symbols of hate, teach them about what a swastika is, what a noose is, what it means, so that the first time that they see it is not on some hate website. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now go to Evelyn. Hi, I'm Evelyn Farkas. I was appointed by President Obama and served as his Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine. I'm running in this race to protect our political freedom and our economic opportunity, basically our American dream. For me, this is deeply personal. My parents are refugees. They fled communist Hungary with nothing. When they got here, of course, they took odd jobs. They learned English. When I was a month old, they moved out to Westchester where they raised me and my three siblings. They taught us there about history. They taught me about World War II, about the Holocaust, about the Cold War. And I grew up grateful for this country, but determined to put an end to the killing, to the genocide. When I went to graduate school, I chose to focus on ethnic conflict and nationalism. But while I was in graduate school, there was a genocide ending in Bosnia. And I went there as a human rights officer. I served for 20 years in the federal government, equally divided between Congress and the executive branch. For seven years, I drafted and passed legislation as a senior staffer on the Senate Armed Services Committee for Carl Levin, who I am proud to say has endorsed my campaign. I know that I am ready to take the baton from Nita Lowy because I have already legislated in Congress. I know how Congress works. I know the process. I know the people. And I also am ready when it comes to the issue of US-Israel relations. I'm the only one among the candidates who has actually represented the United States at the highest levels dealing with Israeli diplomats, with Israeli military officials. I understand that we have a commitment to Israel that is not only political and military, but also moral. And it not only includes to a two-state solution, but also to a qualitative military edge. So thank you. I hope that I can gain your vote on June 23rd. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for having me uh, today. 
I became chair of the National Board of NARAL Pro-Choice America Foundation while we were watching the Kavanaugh hearings. And when I picked up the gavel, I thought of my grandmother who marched for suffrage, my mother who served on our school board, and I thought of Nita Lowy because Nita Lowy has been the greatest champion for women's rights in Congress for the last 30 years. I grew up in Westchester. I raised my three kids here. I'm past president of Temple Beth Abraham. I'm a Schechter mom. I'm on the UJA leadership uh, committee. Nita has been one of our greatest champions for Israel in Congress and for reducing anti-Semitism as well. I have been working day in, day out uh, in my life here in Westchester, fighting to strengthen the Jewish community, strengthen local Jewish institutions, and reduce anti-Semitism and hatred, just as Nita Lowy has done. I got into this race to fight to rebuild the middle class. All of our problems, social and economic, can come back to the main problem of the 30-year collapse of our middle class. And just like Nita, I'm gonna fight for good jobs with good pay and full benefits for women's rights and to get us to the next chapter in our economy where every single person can be seen and can be heard and can have a chance to achieve their goals and their dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Monter. Please unmute. Thank you for that. My name is Mondaire Jones, and it's really an honor to be here. Uh, I'm so grateful to the JDCA for organizing this event. Uh, Israel means a lot to me. I grew up in Rockland County, which, uh, as Senator Carlucci mentioned, has the highest uh, percentage of Jewish people per capita in the entire country. Uh, and so I'm really, really grateful to be running to represent the Jewish community in Congress. Unlike the people we're used to seeing in Congress or as candidates for Congress, I don't come from money or from a political family. I grew up in Section 8 housing and on food stamps and my young single mom still had to work multiple jobs just to put food on the table for us. She got help raising me from my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather was a janitor and my grandmother cleaned homes. And when daycare was too expensive, she took me to work with her. And now I get to run to represent the same people whose homes I watched my grandmother clean growing up. So for me, policy is personal. Uh, with the help of an entire community, I was able to uh, graduate from East Ramapo Public Schools uh, to Stanford University, work in the Obama administration at the Department of Justice, vetting candidates for federal judgeships and working on criminal justice reform. I attended Harvard Law School and more recently have been working as a litigator in the Westchester County Law Department, where among other things, I worked as a legal advisor to the Westchester County Human Rights Commission, advising on how to respond to the uptick in acts of hate, specifically anti-Semitism. I'm gonna continue in the legacy of Nita Lowy as being a friend to Israel. We have to continue our security assistance. Uh, we have to make sure that we are working towards, in good faith, a, a two-state solution. Uh, and that is going to end up with a security for Israel. Thank you. Adam. Thank you so much for having me. And, and thank you for uh, being our ultimate final debate in this uh, long season. It's so great to gather with all of you. This is direct democracy for all of us, and, and I'm so glad to participate. Uh, I am the proud grandson of Holocaust survivors who came to this country after their entire families were killed uh, in the Holocaust. My grandparents came here with a seventh grade education, uh, no command of the English language, uh, but a dream that they could be treated with justice and fairness and equality. Uh, and they lived their version of the American dream. And it has been my purpose and my mission to ensure that everybody can live their version of the American dream. I'm the proud brother of a young man with special needs. And so from the earliest stage, I understood what tikkun olam meant from my brother, from my grandfather, and from the amazing work that my mother, Harriet Schleifer, who is now uh, the president of the American Jewish Committee, the amazing work she did to advocate for my brother, become a expert on special needs education issues, and then a lion in the Jewish community. Uh, I have learned um, from her how to be a Jewish leader and how to fight just as Nita Lowy did for our Jewish community and for a good, strong, strategic relationship with the state of Israel that supports them in their very difficult and dangerous neighborhood. Uh, I actually decided that I would get involved in this after hearing a sermon uh, on Yom Kippur, the day Nita Lowy determined she would not be running, about how divided and angry and embittered and shallow we all are. And I'm here to bring us all together and make sure that we get some things done. Thank you. 
Thank you all for the opening statements. We will now turn to questions. Uh, these questions have been drafted by JDCA with input from the audience. And if you watching, those of you watching have input to send, do send it to info at Jewish Dems and we will incorporate it into our questions. The first question is on COVID-19 and the economic recovery. Economic disparities in America have only widened during the COVID-19 pandemic, and economic inequities are clear even in New York's 17th Congressional District. If elected, what steps would you take in the near term to ensure economic relief and recovery from this crisis, and in the medium and longer term, to address systemic causes of economic inequality within this district? Because David B. gave his opening statements first, Asha, you will begin, followed by David C., Evelyn, Allison, Mondaire, Adam, and then David B. And as a reminder, everyone will have one and a half minutes to respond. Asha. Thank you. Uh, wealth inequality is a, a big problem in this country. And in fact, it doesn't get too much attention among certain groups because many people are out of touch with, uh, you know, not having much most people in America, about 50% or more, don't even have a savings account or an investment. So what would I do? I would first and foremost, as far as the stimulus bill, when we're giving uh, you know, uh, cash on hand to, to people, we have to be realistic about it. $1,200 is not enough. So if a person like me who understands that would definitely push for a more realistic amount that can help us not only pay our housing, but also help cover our bills. Also, when it comes to young people like me, we need to eradicate the student loan debt problem. Student loans is a huge problem for many of us, and a lot of us will, will not be able to pay it off. So we need to completely eradicate the student loan debt as well as revamp the student loan uh, program. Also, we need to uh, support a living wage. That makes sense because of the fact that we live in a very expensive district. $15 is not enough. I have been advocating for $15 uh, federal minimum wage, but by the time that's passed, that's not gonna be enough. We need to have that. Also, we need to make sure we give more federal assistance to small businesses. A lot of businesses have dissolved as a result of coronavirus, uh, but right about now we need to put in more small, um, pour in more federal dollars into the uh, business or private sector to ensure that we re reinvigorate our small business uh, industry. So thank you. Thank you, David B. Carlucci. Sorry, David C, please. Yes, David Carlucci. Again, uh, Senator David Carlucci, thank you. Uh, this is the topic that's on everyone's mind and COVID has really exposed the breakpoints in our society. So first, this is a call to action. We have to have health care for every American. Uh, no question about it. We have to get there. Uh, on the way there, we have to make sure that as a vaccine is developed, that it's free and accessible to every American. Uh, the economy uh, will only get better if we are united together in our response. Congress needs to pass a stimulus package that includes funding to state and local governments. Uh, right now, the fight in Rockland and Westchester, the highest property tax regions or counties in the nation, we have to make sure that funding goes to our schools, to our social safety nets, uh, because if not, everything, it, it will be a disaster. Uh, another round of PPP, we have to make sure that there's oversight on that and then it goes to small businesses that are in need. We've all heard of the uh, situations that have made absolutely no sense in regards to how the PPP was distributed. We have to make sure that the businesses that need it get it. We need ta comprehensive tax reform. We have to repeal the SALT cap that is disastrous for property taxpayers in New York, in Rockland and Westchester counties. Um, these are just a few of the things that we have to do. Um, that's the buzzer, right? Correct. Or is that? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Evelyn. So even before the corona pandemic, we had a society that was in crisis. We have had growing income disparity since the 1950s. And we know also that that unequal social justice or lack of social justice is basically baked into the American cake. So I think we have an opportunity now to address all of these things as part of our reaction to the simultaneously occurring crises. The climate crisis, which we maybe we'll touch upon later, the corona pandemic, the economic depression, and our social justice crisis. We need a new infusion of federal funding, a new deal. 
a new deal that will address the need for affordable housing, affordable and accessible quality healthcare, proper transportation, a green new infrastructure, and obviously providing uh, for, for Americans in our district the opportunity for income that is realistic. So we need a minimum wage and then we need a $15 and then we need to tie it to the cost of living. It must be something that doesn't just stand static. In addition to that, I think that obviously we don't know what's happening with the pandemic. So in the short term, we need to make sure that we continue the stimulus funding. But I basically fundamentally view this as an opportunity for the state, for the federal government to step in, help the state and local governments and our society. Thank you, Allison. Pandemics are poverty multipliers. There are two data points we weren't paying enough attention to before the crisis that are now critically important. Number one, we have the largest income inequality in this country since 1968. That should resonate deeply with people, that, that data point and that year. Uh, number two, we were at the lowest point for the number of business startups in this country in the last 30 years. We need the stimulus money that has already been legislated to get out to communities to actually go out. Uh, $9 billion was uh, provided to support social services, including supporting food banks out of the first CARES Act, and only $250 million of that has actually gone out. We need much greater transparency from this administration of exactly where the money is going, particularly the money that is aimed at small businesses, and to make sure that money aimed for uh, uh, social services and human services actually gets out the door. We need a lot more money to go out for the creation uh, for capital, for the creation of small businesses. We need every single worker to have the opportunity to have a full set of benefits that stays with them instead of the job. And that includes, of course, health insurance, paid sick leave, access to a union, and access to a retirement account so that people, particularly young people, can begin to save money. We have to rebuild the middle class in order to rebuild our economy and our society. Thank you. Mondaire. Yeah, uh, you know, we had, as Evelyn mentioned, tremendous inequality in this country long before COVID-19 exacerbated what pre-existed that. Uh, and it's why I'm fighting for the kinds of structural changes in our economic system that would materially improve the lives of folks. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, it means that we need Medicare for all, and I'm proud to be in support of that. The only policy that would literally ensure everyone. We know that the reason why Black and Hispanic people disproportionately die from COVID-19 is because there was a disproportionately high rate of underlying illness. Well, let's enact legislation that would literally provide health care to everyone so that we can prevent those underlying illnesses from developing in the first place. Let's make sure that we have a housing policy that invests massively in making sure we are building affordable units all throughout this district and all throughout this country so that people don't have to make decisions between getting necessary medical care or whether they can pay their rent or their mortgage. In the short term, we have to be doing immediate cash assistance. I have said repeatedly that a one-time $1,200 check for a subset of the American people is such a slap in the face. I support uh, Representative Maxine Waters' legislation, which, which would do $2,000 for every adult, $1,000 for every, for every child. And we need to be enacting environmental legislation to create green jobs in the process because so many of the jobs lost will not uh, reappear magically after COVID-19 is over. Thank you, Adam. Hi, so I'd like to take this in terms of sort of BC and AC in terms of uh, before COVID and after COVID, or put another way, how do we get past COVID uh, immediately? First, we need a cure for the coronavirus. And I'm so proud of the 6,000 workers, hardworking scientists risking their lives in our district to save um, everybody else's. And so we need a cure. Uh, we need more contact uh, tracing and testing. And we need to in, uh, invigorate and stimulate the economy in the short and medium term. 80% of Americans can't sustain three missed paychecks. 70% of our economy is consumer driven. So we need to build on the $1,200. We need to make that 24 or 36 in the next rounds, at least so that people have cash in their pockets. We need to include college children, college kids in that group because they were exempted from the first round. Then we need 
uh, to stimulate companies by through aid that is conditioned upon not having stock buybacks, not having dividends, but instead committing to keep their employers employed with their health care intact. So we don't send millions of people out into the market for health care or risk them being unemployed in a health crisis. Longer term, we need to repeal the entirety of the Trump tax plan, uh, including the cap on the salt deduction, but all of it, we need it to be fiscally responsible and sustainable. New tax brackets at one and $2 million to make the uh, tax base more equitable and more fair and yes, more fiscally responsible. And then um, beyond that, I favor a carbon tax of 40 or $50 a metric ton so we can have sustainable innovation and green technology without picking winners and losers, but by giving society the measure needs to have a sustainable green energy future. Thank you. David B. In terms of the connection between COVID-19 and uh, income inequality, the solution begins with protecting our frontline workers. We absolutely need to make sure they have the personal protective equipment uh, they need and deserve. We also have to make sure they're uh, are recipients of hazard pay because as a nation, we owe a moral and economic debt to the medical professionals, the first responders and other essential workers that should be paid. We also though need to stand up to big pharma and ensure that all vaccines and treatments uh, produced using taxpayer funds are sold at the lowest possible costs and are able to be, be produced by any manufacturer so that they're available as broadly as possible. And then more broadly, we should ensure uh, that there's national paid sick leave. I was very uh, proud to be a co-sponsor of New York's COVID-19 paid sick leave law. And as of January 1st, all New Yorkers will be entitled to paid sick leave. But the choice for far too many Americans has been for a long time between going to work to make ends meet and taking the time to recover from illness outside of their control or caring for a loved one. And more broadly, when it comes to income inequality, as a tax attorney, I believe we need to reform our tax code, no longer uh, favor uh, earnings made on Wall Street over actual income from Main Street and the hardworking men and women of our country. So there's a host of things we should be doing, but those just uh, starts, and I'm committed to seeing them through as a Congress member. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to our second question on racial justice and police reform. We at the Jewish Democratic Council of America have been shaken by the horrific murder of George Floyd, and we join calls from throughout the country to end systemic racism in our society. We know the words Black Lives Matter are not enough, and what also matters in this moment is taking meaningful action. If elected, what would you do to fight for racial justice, including in New York's 17th district? We will start with David C. and then Evelyn, Allison, Mondaire, Adam, David B. and Asha. David C. Thank you. There, there's so much that we need to do to root out injustice and fight back against racism in this country. And this past week, I had the, the honor, or last week, of passing a package of legislation in the New York State Senate to deal with police reform. And this package of legislation needs to be taken federally. Uh, we passed the Eric Gardner anti-chokehold legislation. We passed legislation to take uh, police misconduct out of the hands of the internal police department and have an independent investigation. Um, we worked on legislation that passed to deal with racial profiling. And I could go through this list. However, this is just a sample of the legislation that needs to be passed federally. We also have to work at our diversion. How do we divert people from the criminal justice system? That's why I passed legislation to proliferate our problem solving courts here in New York State, so that when someone does start to enter the criminal justice system, that they meet a judge that actually is aware of the issues, whether it's mental illness or domestic violence, uh, that will go a long way. We have to work to raise the age of criminal responsibility across the country. That's something that we've done in New York State, but we need to do. We also have to end mandatory minimum sentencing in this nation. Our prisons are filled with people that really should not be there. Uh, we have to get people help and treatment and not just incarceration. That's something that I've been committed to and we have to continue to work towards that. And again, we have to pass our never forget legislation to be proactive, to teach children, not just about the Holocaust, but also about the history of slavery and injustice in this country. Uh, those are just a few of the things that we have to work for. And I look forward to continuing that. The work that I've done in the Senate, um, I've put my name on this legislation, I've authored many pieces of it, and look forward to bringing 
that energy and that passion to Washington to get these pieces of legislation passed. Uh, it's many things we have to do. I'm glad we took the first step in New York, but we have a long journey ahead of us. Thank you. Evelyn. So as I said in my introduction, I've spent a lot of my life, in, in particular my academic life, focused on ethnic conflict and nationalism, and obviously racism is a component of that. Three years ago, I authored an opinion piece that was published in The Hill that called for the commission on, on the legacy of slavery and racism in America. It, it was a call to support existing legislation that, has, that was entered into or sponsored by uh, Representative Conyers every Congress and now has been sponsored by Sheila Jackson Lee and Barbara Lee. It is imperative that we all understand our common history, but of course that is not enough. And so we need to make sure that we institute a bunch of legislation to produce more social justice for all Americans, but starting with black Americans today. We need to institute police reform. We know what many of the things that we need to do are at the local level. At the federal level, we need to eliminate qualified immunity. We need to give the Department of Justice the right to review and adjudicate cases of misconduct and police violence. On the criminal justice reform front, I went to Sing Sing even before I was a candidate um, with a group um, uh, of, of independent private citizens. Um, I went later as a, as a candidate. Um, what the superintendent does there, at least he tries to provide a glide path to rehabilitation, not just punishment, but rehabilitation. We need to end the mass incarceration in our country. We need to eliminate private prisons. There are many things we can do to help our fellow citizens keep them out of prison and promote racial equity. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. My life's work has been fighting for social justice and tikkun olam uh, all across this country. I've worked in Baltimore fighting for affordable housing in East St. Louis for environmental justice, in Oakland on racial justice, and in every single state on reproductive freedom and reproductive justice. This moment in time is extraordinary because usually we're talking about policy change or a laundry list of policies. We actually have an opportunity for deep systemic change. The difference is the metaphor that I use, if you wanted to pull a weed out of the ground and you just grab the top of the flower and pulled, that would be policy change. If you dig down into the roots, that's systemic change. Jim Clyburn calls this an opportunity to reimagine policing, to move from punishment to protection and prevention in every part of our society. So for instance, to reimagine schools, uh, instead of walking through uh, metal detectors and having police in schools, imagine if we invested instead in social service in food for kids, in mental health counseling, in addiction uh, reduction and, and services. Every part of our society, there is an opportunity to pivot to focusing on becoming really deeply human to ensure that every single child, every single person has an opportunity to have a decent job, to be, uh, to be free in this country, to be unharassed everywhere they go. Thank you. Thank you, Mondaire. Yeah, uh, it has been particularly hard to, to be black in America these past few weeks uh, in between running for Congress uh, and rallying for black lives in Westchester and in Rockland counties. Uh, folks like myself have been constantly re-traumatized by images on television and stories that we hear from all corners of the United States. Um, and I'm fortunate and, and grateful uh, and proud to have been talking about issues of racial justice long before they became popular uh, in this race. You know, I've uh, been doing this from an early age, right? When I was 19 years old, I chaired a committee on the NAACP's National Board of Directors. Uh, and in and, and the Obama administration, I worked on how to reduce recidivism for people leaving federal prisons and how to reintegrate people into society. When I was a law student at Harvard, I went into Roxbury and Dorchester and provided pro bono free legal representation to people facing criminal charges. We need desperately policing reform. That means national standards. Uh, for law enforcement, eliminating the chokehold, requiring officers to identify themselves and engage in de-escalation tactics, uh, passing a statute that ends once and for all qualified immunity. Um, we have to go on the criminal justice front and making sure that we are ending mass incarceration, including, yes, eliminating mandatory minimums and legalizing cannabis. But we have to have, as I've said repeatedly, a broad conception of systemic racism extending far beyond individual examples of police killings 
It is a property tax based funded system of public education. It is a healthcare system that conditions your access to medical care on your economic means, disproportionately harming black and brown people. We must, uh, we must have a broad conception to anti-racist in our society. Thank you. Adam. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think we all see that when Thomas Jefferson said uh, all men were created equal, uh, he did not mean it. And we fought a war and a president gave his life to heal the original sin of our country. And we got the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments and we got a union army to enforce them. And for 10 years, we had black senators and uh, representatives in the South. The union army left. We had a hundred years of racial injustice and oppression in under Jim Crow until Martin Luther King reawoke the imagination and empathy of the United States. And here we are 50 years later and we see how much more work we have to do. I understand what that work is. When I was a federal prosecutor, my mentor, my hero was a man, Lawrence Middleton, black man who grew up in the racist South, who came to be the chief of the criminal division of the US Attorney's Office. And he won convictions for the officers who um, violated Mr. Rodney King's civil rights. Uh, those were my colleagues. Those were the people I learned under. There is a place in the federal government and in the Department of Justice to enforce the civil rights of all of us in America, including and especially our African-American brothers and sisters. On top of that, we need to condition federal funding on um, de-escalation training and implicit bias training. We also need to end qualified immunity, not because that's a slogan, but because it has, when you study it, as I have, an unfairly ossifying aspect in the law. It freezes the law in place in a way that's not helpful. We must get rid of it. So there's so much that the federal government can do, but as President Obama said, much of that work also has to be done at the state and local level. It's the job of the federal government to oversee and ensure that those entities have the right incentives and the right oversight to make sure we do justice for everyone. Thank you, David B. Uh, thank you. I, I was very proud uh, last week to vote for every bill in the uh, New York State criminal justice package as we promote uh, transparency and accountability, particularly when it comes to law enforcement. Those are principles I've been pushing for my entire time in the uh, state legislature. Uh, but our federal government has uh, far more work to do. Um, some of those are things like mandating independent reviews of police related shootings and deaths, something that we now have uh, in statute, uh, thanks to last week's actions here in New York. But we also need to have the federal government abolish uh, private prisons. The prison industrial complex, I think, undermines uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, we should end mandatory minimums, uh, bring an end to qualified immunity. Um, but more broadly, we should use the power of the federal government uh, in terms of our spending to ensure that at the local level uh, there is real attention to these issues, uh, whether that's um, making sure that there are body cameras uh, for police officers, uh, ensuring that there's more anti-bias and uh, de-escalation training uh, for police officers. These are things where the federal government can not just lead by example, but also uh, promote throughout our country, something that I think is uh, sorely needed. And I hope to uh, be a champion of these issues uh, as your member of Congress. Thank you. Asha. Thank you for the question. You know, as, a, uh, as an African-American woman, uh, you know, also running for office and watching this happen, it is uh, very uh, touching. And, you know, I must tell you, that I'm, I, you know, I'm still very concerned about systemic racism. In fact, I've been so vocal about this issue that I actually talked about, talked about it, um, solutions at many uh, BLM rallies, and in fact, earned an endorsement from the mayor of Elmsport, because not only I talked about, you know, we have to address racial profiling, as well as, you know, de-escalation, invest in de-escalation tactics, like Senator uh, David Buckwell mentioned, but also we have to combat the economic issue that involves in this. See, George Floyd was attacked not only because he was Black, but also because of because of his economic status too as well. And we have to really uh, um, uh, address that issue because you know what, if he looked differently where he probably had money, there would have been a deterrence possibly there. But again, we have to um, um, uh, combat, um, also support ending um, mass incarceration, invest in a national standard, for many, uh, for you know, in, in Congress, uh, we definitely need to, you know, provide national guidance when it comes to addressing excessive, um, excessive use of force. Um, we also have to, you know, uh, um, support police reform. Uh, you know, look into uh, investing more into the cultural um, cultural programs, making sure that those uh, law enforcement officers that are hired understand the environment that they are operating in. That is very important. 
comes to rules of engagement. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to our third question on the issue of anti-Semitism. As New Yorkers, including those in New York's 17th district, know all too well, in the past year, we have seen a record number of anti-Semitic attacks and incidents across America. If elected, what measures would you take to combat the rise of violent anti-Semitism and white nationalism, which President Trump himself has played a role in emboldening? Evelyn will begin, followed by Allison, Mondaire, Adam, David B, Asha, and David C. Evelyn. So the first thing, Haley, we have to do when it comes to anti-Semitism is elect leaders who will speak out clearly and unequivocally against anti-Semitism and all forms of hate and otherism. This is, we really are experiencing right, right now an, a, a national epidemic of hate which includes anti-Semitism. And so the first thing is leaders need to speak up about it. The second thing, of course, is that leaders need to make sure that people in America, starting with children, are educated so that they understand our history, they understand the, the past bad history, the Holocaust, and I think that needs to extend to adults, unfortunately, in America as well. On the legal front, in terms of what the federal government can do, we need to make sure that we have in, we increase funds to protect communities that are vulnerable because of hate crimes. So for example, in Monsi, where we had the hate crime, the stabbing, the Hanukkah stabbing, we need to make sure that those communities are protected. And then we need to look at curriculum, school curriculum, I mentioned, making sure that people are prop properly educated. But it really starts with leadership at the top and working assiduously across the board to make sure that there is no no room for hate, that there is nowhere to hide. And then I will also add one other thing, because the social media, um, Facebook, all of the various platforms, they behave and they act as if they should be, they should not be regulated, that they should be treated as paper. They should be treated as newspaper with editorial boards responsible for the content that they produce, including anti-Semitic, Holocaust denial, and hate speech. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, thank you. I um, I have been working very hard on reducing anti-Semitism and hate both uh, in my community through Temple to Beth Abraham and online. I am a pioneer in the use of social media for social change. I've written three books on the topic. I've been working with the Gates Foundation on how to make sure we use artificial intelligence and automation for social good. There is no question that the social media platforms have created echo chambers of hate. And um, we have an obligation um, in Congress to take a hard look at what's called Section 230 from the 1996 Communications Decency Act, which ensured that the platforms were immune from liability. Um, I do not um, support rescinding Section 230, but I think it has to be amended that the platforms have to work harder to reduce hate speech they have to stop using our attention by keeping us in those um, echo chambers as well. The FBI needs to create a database that connects online hate to on land um, hate acts. We need to invest in community mediators, which goes back to the reframing of policing as well. Every communi community um, needs to have paid uh, mediators to help bring groups together. And we are going to have to teach children how to pivot from teaching what to learn to how to learn, to reject hate speech, reject lies, um, and uh, fight for freedom in our communities. Thank you. Mondaire. Uh, you know, I I'm not Jewish, and, and I could never know how it feels to be a victim of anti-Semitism. Uh, but I am Black, and I know how it feels to be discriminated against for that uh, and for being gay. And, and after what happened in Muncie, I pinned an op-ed uh, called, you know, as a black American, I stand with my Jewish brothers and sisters, because we know that historically, in the course of the civil rights movement, for example, with Schroener, Goodman, and Cheney in the freedom, during the freedom rides, that there has been a historic relationship between the black and the Jewish communities. I hope to be someone who strengthens that, uh, who shows leadership on that issue and, and expands upon that legacy, especially when at times in our history, it hasn't been as strong as it should have, frankly especially more recently. Um, 
you know, legislatively, we have to make sure, as uh, Evelyn mentioned, we are continuing to provide and increasing, in fact, security assistance to our houses of worship, or worship including synagogues. Uh, we have to make sure that we are requiring, if you're going to get federal funding, that, that your schools should be teaching the history of anti-Semitism in this country. One of the things I learned when I was a lawyer for Westchester County as a legal advisor to the Human Rights Commission was that we didn't even have a central repository because there were so many different 43, in fact, municipalities to even record incidents of hate uh, and specific anti-Semitism. And so we need a better record keeping of this stuff so that we can share that data, share best practices on how to respond to anti-Semitism and other forms of white nationalism and hold people accountable. Thank you, Adam. Yes, so uh, as I said, my grandparents uh, survived the Holocaust and it's been 75 years uh, since uh, we um, overcame that horrible, horrible blight on history. And so it is so sad and it is frankly unacceptable and nothing matters more to me than stopping the trend of anti-Semitic violence and domestic terror that we see all over the New York region, including in our district. That's why I visited Rabbi Rotenberg uh, in Muncie in the aftermath of that horrific uh, anti-Semitic hate crime. And it's why I've been pointing out that after we had a tragic incident of violence at the Finkelstein Memorial Library where a, a black woman lost her life in a, in a assassination, if you will, that um, the same uh, laws that protect uh, Hasidic members of the community um, uh, celebrating Hanukkah and exercising their First Amendment rights also protect our LGBTQ uh, Americans and our Black Americans and everyone else from being victims of hate crime. It's the Matthew Shepard and Thomas Bird Hate Crime Prevention Act. I called for strong enforcement in that case. I was so heartened to see the U.S. Attorney's Office bring charges under that law. We need to go beyond that, though. We need, to, in addition to using our federal. Um, criminal laws, we need to work as we, as Governor Cuomo did, to have license plate readers and other security in communities that are targets of domestic terror. And I praise very much, and I'm so grateful for Senator Rosen and for Representative Maloney for bringing the Never Again Education Act uh, in Congress, because that is so critical. We cannot, of course, get past our demons unless we learn from them. And so we must learn about the Holocaust and all forms of hate if we are to overcome them. And I'm so glad that we have that legislation running through Congress right now. Thank you, David B. Please. As a, thank you. Uh, as a state assembly member and a member of the Westchester community, I have uh, condemned incidents of anti-Semitism, both violent attacks and the spreading of hate. I served on the Westchester Advisory uh, Committee of the Anti-Defamation League. Together we worked and I continue to work to combat hate in all its forms. Uh, in particular, uh, we promoted the No Place for Hate initiative, which is offered for free to local school districts uh, to use with their students. I strongly believe that the best antidote to hate is to call it out, condemn it, and as a unified community, educate youngsters and the population at large about its pernicious effects. And I think that's certainly true with regards to anti-Semitism as it spreads to discrimination against uh, all peoples. I'm also not one uh, to point, just point out anti-Semitism as a problem from one political perspective. Uh, I'm keenly aware that affects our Democratic Party as well. And if I have the honor of being elected to Congress, it will be my responsibility to call out anti-Semitism and racism, especially within the House of Representatives. Thank you, Asha. Thank you for this question. Um, I must say that uh, I would underscore the education uh, in peace to it. It's very important. You know, there was anti-Semitism um, um, issues that happened up at my school, Sleepy Hollow High School, where they had to shut down Sleepy Hollow, right, Allison, <laughs> for quite some time. So the education is very important as far as teaching young children about against uh, hate, you know, understand that hate speech, hate crimes are, are just uh, terrible conduct that we do not need in the United States. So, and, I, and I, I've also learned as a student too, visiting Anne Frank's uh, museum in Amsterdam as a study abroad student at the University of Oxford. And that changed my life as well, as far as how hate can be such, such so detrimental for our society. Also, I wanna look at the other piece to it that makes sense too, as far as being a congressional member and how we have to also uh, attack foreign, the foreign policy aspect, the national security aspect. As a congressional member, as we're watching hate, crimes, especially when it comes to anti-Semitism abroad, we have to make sure that we have the responsibility to uh, address that on the, on the federal level and, and be able to protect 
our young children, our people from those outside influences and getting them to be engaged in these hate, um, hate behaviors. So it's very important that we uh, combat that. And I did that um, uh, as a commentator at I-24 News where I constantly spoke with the state of Israel as well as other uh, senior officials about the hate crimes that are flaring up abroad and how that impacts us here in the United States. And we can do that as congressional members. Thank you. Thank you, David C. Thank you. Yes, I was on the scene there that night in Muncie when we had the Hanukkah massacre, um, working with people, calming tensions, and afterwards was able to deliver funding for license plate readers in the community and throughout uh, parts of Rockland County. Um, this is something that I've seen firsthand, the rise of anti-Semitism right here in this community. And that's why I talked about earlier about the never forget legislation, that we have to make sure that our children are seeing age appropriate curriculum, that we are proactive, that the first place they see a swastika or a noose is not on some hate website or graffiti scrawled on a park bench. We have to be proactive. We also have to hold social media companies accountable. Uh, the proliferation of hate speech that has just been fanned uh, the flames have been fanned by President Trump. Uh, we have to hold social media companies accountable. I've put legislation in the state Senate to have protocol and best practices that have to be followed so we can limit that. Um, I worked with Governor Cuomo shortly after the attack in Muncie on creating a domestic terrorism law here in New York State. Um, these are some of the things that are just so important and we, we have to continue to have a federally uh, dedicated fund to harden our targets of terror. We've done that in New York State. I was able to help get funding for the JCC of Rockland to make sure that they can harden uh, their, their center. But that has to go for the, the Pride Center and other uh, targets of hate. Uh, we have to make sure there's a dedicated funding source at the federal level and look forward to doing that like I've done in New York State. Thank you. We will now move on to our next question and the topic is Israel. We at JDCA are deeply concerned about Republican attempts to use Israel as a political wedge issue in this election to divide Jewish voters. We've seen it before, and while it's never worked in helping Republicans win over the majority of the Jewish vote, we will no, no doubt see it again. How do you view President Trump's handling of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and what is your view on the prospects of unilateral Israeli annexation of parts of the West Bank. We will begin with Allison, then Mondaire, Adam, David B, Asha, David C, and Evelyn. Allison. Thank you so much. Uh, Israel is a topic near and dear to my heart. I have been there five times, including a, a trip sponsored by the State Department to teach both Israeli and Palestinian NGOs how to use social media. We need a two-state solution in Israel and Israel has to be a nonpartisan issue uh, in the United States Congress. The approach by the Trump administration has been dreadful and uh, completely non-constructive. I am absolutely opposed to the annexation of the West Bank. It is illegal. It has been condemned by many countries, uh, including um, Vice President Biden. Uh, we need to ensure that Israel's security is a top priority of the United States. Uh, we need to ensure that we recommit to the humanitarian aid for the Palestinian people. I have enormous empathy for them, given how little support they have had from all of the governments of that region. And of course, we need to ensure that Iran is never, ever a nuclear um, power. The support of Israel is so fundamental to our American values and to our American Jewish values. Uh, it breaks my heart that this has become such a partisan issue on both the left and the right. And I would fight as hard as I can to make sure that Israel's security, Israel's borders, uh, Israeli lives um, are protected and uh, supported through the Congress. Thank you, Mondaire. Yeah, you know, Donald Trump's behavior in the context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is as Allison just mentioned, dreadful. Uh, and it is certainly undermining any prospects for a two-state solution, which is why I'm so excited to be voting to elect Joe Biden, our next president of the United States. 
I am deeply committed to seeing a two-state solution. I am deeply committed to strengthening uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, continuing to support security assistance. Uh, and yes, I do oppose the annexation, the unilateral annexation of the West Bank. I think it endangers uh, Israelis in the region. I think it inflames tensions between Israel and the Arab states. Uh, and of course, uh, it would be fatal, I think, uh, to a two-state solution. We would be going into uncharted territory. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we are uh, involving Palestinians and Israelis uh, as a good faith uh, friend, uh, as, as the United States, that is, uh, as part of a, a negotiation process where we, we end up with something that both parties can live with. Uh, and yes, we should be providing humanitarian assistance to Palestinians, uh, even as we continue to support Israel uh, and making sure that this does not become a partisan wedge issue, as others have mentioned it has become. It is deeply unfortunate. Um, I hate seeing the attacks on Israel. Uh, I'm gonna be someone who will be a friend to Israel and in the tradition of Nina Lowy, and I agree we should, have, we should make sure we are not allowing a nuclear Iran. Thank you. Adam. Yes, as someone who's spent months living in Israel, uh, who has family there, who suffer under the uh, threat of rockets at all times and who risk their lives to defend that state. Uh, I, I thank you for the question. It's critical that we um, move past President Trump's uh, uh, international relations of interpersonality. And what do I mean by that? We have a president who, whose entire relationship with France is defined on whose handshake is stronger or whose hot mic was on when he's speaking with uh, Angela Merkel or how close he feels to Bibi Netanyahu. And I think it's been a grievous error to allow uh, the Israeli-United States relationship to be one that is partisan. Um, we cannot allow that. We must reclaim that uh, relationship as a strategic, enduring, and mutually beneficial one, um, where we share technologies, where we both get return on that investment, so to speak, where we ensure that Israel has a qualitative military edge, and where we ensure that in that very tough neighborhood where they live, surrounded by enemies calling for their utter destruction uh, and murder, that we protect the only democracy in the Middle East and the people therein um, from those threats. Um, as for how we can do that and get to a permanent, sustainable two-state solution. I agree that at times the president has been unhelpful in that regard, although I am heartened to see uh, Israel expand its relationships throughout its region to bring in other parties so that we can someday, when we get a willing partner, and I'm not sure we do right now, but when we get a willing partner to come to the table in a real good faith way, that we can be productive about it. My concern about some of the annexations is that they will ultimately require dismantling and that will dislocate and harm people both sides. So I don't favor that, but I do favor uh, strong Israel support and, uh, and ensuring that we um, help them out until they get a willing peace partner. Thank you. David B. The long-standing relationship between the United States and Israel has been of great mutual benefit to both countries, and we need to make sure that that endures on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I uh, believe that when, uh, for example, President Trump recognized uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, that was the right thing to do, but it was the right thing to do because it was uh, some moral imperative uh, that uh, we recognize that Israel will always exist and will always have at least part of Jerusalem as its capital. And uh, we need to make sure that that's the basis for the, for the relationship between our two countries, not the um, views of any one particular political party or a particular occupant of the White House. It's been longstanding uh, policy in, in the United States on a congressional level for many years. So when we approach things like the question of annexation, the question is, is it an obstacle uh, for peace? It depends on how it's done. I really feel that we have to be a honest broker towards a two-state solution. That two-state solution is gonna come at the point when Israel feels uh, secure and is willing to make that offer. And when we, they have uh, partners on the Palestinian side willing to embrace uh, peace, and I think we need to absolutely encourage that to happen. Thank you. Asha. 
Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I must tell you, I've, I worked on uh, security, uh, helping with the European Command to ensure that we have security for the state of Israel. And I must tell you, it was very um, difficult to watch what was going on, especially from you know uh, terrorism and uh, rebel groups coming out of Syria, impacting the security uh, of Israel. So uh, you know, this is near and dear to my heart that as a Congresswoman, I would definitely ensure that we continue our security assistance uh, to the state of Israel. Um, I must also say that it is very important that we need better U.S. global leadership as far as reinvigorating fair negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, that is so important as far as making sure that we have, we are pushing for cooperation, not conflict. We're not using this issue as a bipartisan um, issue. That is not uh, what we should be doing because that creates conflict and also it impacts other neighbors that are in part of the Middle East, like the Gulf Cooperation Council, as well as Egypt. Uh, when I was there in uh, in the uh, region, you know, I was definitely a proponent of making sure that we continue our Bright Star mission, ensuring that Egypt, along with Israel, continue uh, our, our peaceful relationship. So we need to ensure that we are uh, supporting issues that, that help bring cooperation and peace for the state of Israel. And of course, I am against a unilateral decision to annex uh, the West Bank. Um, I think that we, again, we need peaceful solutions or peaceful negotiations between the two parties. Thank you. Thank you. David C. Thank you. I'm running for Congress to strengthen the U.S.-Israeli relations, and we have to have a commitment to that. Uh, when President Trump attacks Democrats for being anti-Israel, he's really not showing his support for Israel. He's doing it out of political reasons, and we have to push back to make sure that Israel does not become a politicized partisan issue. And I, I thank the Jewish Democratic Council for standing up, for defending Israel, for defending Jewish values, and making sure that Democrats have a voice without making it a, a political partisan issue. Um, we also have to push back against Democrats and Republicans that want to criticize the Israeli government for actions that they haven't even taken yet. Uh, we have to make sure that we uh, know our place and that's to support Israel, to provide, uh, pro provide funding uh, without, without conditions, that we work together for a, a two-state solution. Um, but we have to make sure that we're not getting in the way of progress. Uh, I also support the, the move uh, of the embassy to Jerusalem I think it was the right decision. Um, but unfortunately, I think this president is using Israel as a political wedge instead of doing the right thing, Flanning, uh, fanning the flames of, uh, of, of partisanship when we should be working together to find peace and work with our Arab neighbors to make sure that Israel is not threatened and that the United States interests uh, stay protected and strong. Evelyn. So I have been traveling to Israel over the last 30 years, personally and professionally, and I'm very proud of the fact that we have had bipartisan consensus in support of the U.S. relationship for Israel, which is, as I said, not only political and military, but moral. And this president he is, is threatening to put all of that in jeopardy by standing up and saying that only Republicans care about Israel. He's so wrong but he's throwing it out there trying to drive a wedge into that bipartisanship. It's crucial that we maintain a bipartisan commitment to the two party, to the two state solution, because with that two state solution is the best chance for Israel to remain a Jewish state and a democratic state, for the Palestinian people to have a state and for the US to continue to provide a robust security deterrent to the Israeli government. The qualitative military edge that the office I worked in helped develop and maintain is critical to deterring all the bad actors who would imperil Israel. And if President Trump continues with his unilateral foreign policy, that will put Israel in great danger because what the United States has always done is lead the international community in support of Israel, in support of the peace process, in support of dealing with the threat posed by Iran, not only with its nuclear program, but also through its terrorist and disruptive foreign policy in the region. So the international community, Israel, the United States, rely on the United States to be, or the US president rather, to be a leader of all peoples. Thank you.
Great. Okay. I'm going to mix things up for a moment. I promised all the questions would include audience, in, uh, audience input, and we've received quite a few questions on Israel. So I'm going to ask yet another question on Israel. This one is a yes or no question, so let's try to stick with that. And it comes from Erica Newman. Do you support the Memorandum of Understanding that was signed under President Obama in 2016, giving Israel $3.3 billion annually in assistance in addition to $500 million in missile defense annually for the next 10 years without conditions? Again, a yes for no question. We will go in the same order that we just went. Uh, so let me find that order. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Allison right. begins. Right. Allison has already answered, but go ahead, Allison. Yes. <laughs> Great. Mondaire. Yes. Adam. Ken. Okay, for our non Hebrew speaking. <laughs> yes. Uh, David B. Yes. Asha. Yes. David C. Yes. And Evelyn. I said it before, yes. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now turn to our final topic for questions, which is healthcare. Even amid the largest public health crisis of our lifetimes, Republicans continue to attempt to chip away at the protections in the Affordable Care Act. If elected, how would you help to ensure that all Americans have access to affordable and quality health care? We'll begin with Adam, then David B., Asha, David C., Evelyn, Allison, and Mondaire. Adam. Yeah, so uh, in the 21st century in the United States, every single American should have access to quality and affordable care. Uh, we need to close that 8.5% eight gap that currently exists for those who are uncovered. I propose and uh, support uh, expanding Obamacare and creating a Medicare for those who want a op public option so that we can have an option that folks can choose that can compete and I hope outcompete the private plan. As David Buckwald has said at other points and I agree, we wouldn't design the plan we have right now and as Allison Fine has said at other points, all the conflicting codes and the morass of confusion we have is not a great system. But right now it's a system we have and I'm not anxious to take it away quickly from people who fought in collective bargaining and otherwise to have the plans they want. I hope that a public option outcompetes it. I hope we add to that that, by the way, a cap on out-of-pocket expenses, regulation of the insurance industry so that we have things like fertility services, which is a necessity, not a luxury for LGBTQ and other Americans, and also that we go after the bad actors, like those who corner markets and um, antibiotics that are 70 years old, or EpiPens, or insulin, things that don't reflect innovation but are being driven up by anti-competitive practices. That's a big part of what we need to do to make uh, quality, affordable health care a reality for everyone. Um, so I'm going to end early. Thanks. Thank you. David B. Thank you. Uh, I'm proud of our record here in New York State having one of the uh, best implementations of the Affordable Care Act, including a health care exchange, which has been, uh, again, uh, open during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic so that uh, those who can uh, can have access to health insurance. We do, though, need to recognize more broadly going forward that not everyone is able to afford health insurance, uh, even under the Affordable Care Act. And you know, I'm a believer that uh, although as a matter of sound economic and uh, social policy, it would be good to, from a scratch, to have a uh, single payer system. And I've voted for a single payer system in, in New York. I really believe that in order to actually accomplish the task and to um, really improve health care for, for people, we have to have a robust public option because the issue is you know, how do we get closer and closer to that uh, goal of universal health care coverage when millions of Americans have health care coverage they don't want to give up? So I side with Joe Biden in uh, having a robust public option approach. And I think that's the right one, both for our country and for our party. Thank you, Asha. Yes. Uh, so um, I support a pathway to a Medicare for all. And the reason why I say pathway is because, uh, um, again, with going back to your question that we're going to have Republicans who are going to most likely push back is because of one reason, because of the revenue that we need to support a Medicare for all, a Medicare for all. And, um, and I believe that in order to do so, we have to generate more revenue by changing the tax code, repealing, replacing the Trump uh, tax policy, also ending these endless wars, uh, find more revenue to generate in order to be able to achieve a Medicare for all over time. So again, I agree with most of my opponents where we need to invest in a public option, stabilize Obamacare, 
but over time uh, generate more revenue to uh, be able to achieve in Medicare for all. Thank you. Thank you, David C. There are major inefficiencies in our healthcare system. I support having every American have access to quality health care. That has to be the goal. We have to get there. My time in the Senate, I've authored and passed legislation where I've met with residents where they have been denied essential health care that we know could make a dramatic difference in their life, but they were denied it by a bureaucrat from the insurance company. That has to change. What can we do? Well, we can raise taxes on the wealthiest Americans. That's something that I support, but we can make health care more efficient. We need to allow Medicare to, to negotiate the price of prescription drugs. We have to push back hard and end price gouging in this country. There are so many cases where I've met with parents that are desperate to get an EpiPen and other types of uh, important drugs that they need. The cost of insulin keeps rising. Insulin isn't a new drug. Why does it keep continually rise? Um, President Trump, one of his policies is allow us to import drugs from Canada. The same drugs that are made in the United States are then Im imported to Canada and then we can get them back cheaper than the ones that are made here. It doesn't make sense. We need to allow for Medicare to negotiate the price of prescription drugs and we have to have dental, mental health, physical health covered for all Americans. Uh, we've seen the discrepancy with COVID. This has long existed. I hope that the silver lining of this uh, epidemic that we're facing is that healthcare needs to be accessible for every American. Thank you, Evelyn. Access to quality, affordable health care is obviously a human right. And so we need to institute a public option immediately to make sure that those Americans who are not covered or those Americans who are covered under the expensive Trump care, such as myself, can have access to quality, affordable health care. I'm proud that I served under President Obama, who took the first steps in this direction, and that I've been endorsed by Dr. Zeke Emanuel, who also was the person who was the architect of the ACA. I believe that we should not get rid of the private system because we would put too many people at risk. But as my colleagues have said, if we have a robust option in the public sector funded by the public government, that will attract people from the private plans. We also need to make sure that the public option has a robust mental health capability or component rather because we should be worried not just about physical fitness but about mental fitness and we should have physical fitness exams and mental fitness exams throughout the course of our lives. In addition to that we need to empower the federal government through HHS to negotiate the price of drugs. American taxpayers pay pay pharmaceutical companies, give them research grants to develop pharmaceuticals, and then those pharmaceutical companies set the prices in America without any negotiating capability on the part of the American government. In foreign countries, people, their citizens pay far less because those come exponentially less actually, because those governments are empowered to negotiate on behalf of their citizens. So we need to make sure that we empower our government to negotiate and also relax the importation laws, although they may be less necessary if our government can negotiate. Thank you. Allison. Uh, we know two fundamental truths about our current healthcare system uh, in America. One, it is a Byzantine patchwork system of healthcare providers, insurance providers, and drug, co drug companies that make no sense to anyone else. And the second is that it's woefully broken economically. I want to get to a single payer uh, system. I believe we begin to get there through uh, broadening a, a public option. We have just seen what happens with millions of Americans who've been unemployed and uh, their health insurance stayed with their employer. They're going to end up on COBRA, which is wildly expensive, um, or they're going to have to find, um, or they're going to have to get into the ACA. Uh, this is a, an incredibly painful moment, particularly for people um, who already have serious um, health problems. We also need to standardize, by creating the public system, we create an opportunity for the federal government to standardize the billing as well. My son had an appendectomy last year. We had bills from seven different um, medical providers that came to $30,000. It made no sense. And if we had done it at a different hospital, it would be a, a whole different set of bills and set of prices. That makes no sense. And we need the federal government to be able to negotiate lower drug prices. We also need to cover mental health. We need to cover reproductive health care for all women. 
Um, and we have to make sure that Medicare is expanded so that everything neck up is also covered. Thank you, Mandir. We've just seen 40 million people lose their jobs over the past 10 weeks alone. And even before COVID-19, there were 87 million people in this country who were either uninsured or underinsured, meaning they had some health coverage, but economics were still a barrier to accessing, to getting necessary medical care. Uh, so I'm proud to be in support of a single payer Medicare for all system, just like Nita Lowy has signed on to it in 2017 and again in 2019. Uh, it is the only health care policy that would literally ensure everyone has coverage in this country. Uh, public option, unfortunately, does not go far enough. Uh, I, I recognize that uh, it would be an improvement, but for me, it does not go far enough because there would still be over 10 million people who would be left uninsured. And of course, Medicare for all would result in cost savings. Uh, we are estimated to spend right now $52 trillion in health care over the next 10 years. Medicare for all would result in $5 trillion in cost savings. Uh, and in doing so, we would expand coverage to include mental health services, uh, dental care, vision, long-term care. Uh, and, and you'd get to keep your physician. There'd be no distinction between in-network and out-of-network. And of course, if you'd lose your job, you wouldn't have to worry about uh, your ability to get necessary medical care. So I'm really proud to be running in support of that. I think we desperately need it. Uh, I think it would help to eliminate the racial disparities and the income-based disparities that we are seeing all throughout this country. And it's why I'm proud to be saying I'm gonna be fighting for it. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for answering these questions. Uh, and thanks to the audience members who submitted them. Uh, you should know that the topics were not chosen by coincidence. These are the issues that are driving the Jewish vote, including in your uh, district. Uh, we will now move on to one minute closing statements by each candidate, starting with Mondaire. And by now we all know the order, but I'll keep going. Uh, followed by Adam, David B, Asha, David C, Evelyn and Allison. Mondaire. Um, again, I'm just, I'm really proud to be running to represent the community that raised me. You know, I'm a, I'm a Rockland guy. I grew up in the East Ramapo Central School District, and um, the Jewish community is very special to me. Obviously, I don't know what it's like to be Jewish, uh, but maybe through osmosis. <laughs> uh, and, and so I'm really proud to also be running to, uh, to preserve that legacy of Congresswoman Nia Lowy. Our relationship with Israel in particular is something that uh, has to be strengthened. Uh, we have to uh, beat back attempts by Republicans in particular in Congress and in the Oval Office to undermine that strategic uh, and moral relationship. Uh, and I'm willing and able to do precisely that and also to expand upon the legacy by broadening the coalition of people who are supportive of the Jewish community. Uh, and that starts with going into communities that maybe historically haven't thought much about it. Uh, but, that, but that would be natural allies, as our history suggests during the civil rights movement. Uh, so I'm really honored to be here, and I hope to have your support in this election. Thank you. Adam. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. We've got at least 121 people watching. This is participatory democracy in its purest form, and I'm so glad to be here engaging with all of my colleagues and all of you. Uh, as I said, I'm the proud a grandchild of Holocaust survivors, and I am so uh, proud and grateful. I know if they could see me here today, knowing what they went through and coming to this country uh, with no education and uh, and no English and, and only a hope and a belief in the American dream, if they could see that their grandchild had an opportunity to run for United States Congress, I think that would be the most amazing thing. And so I know that it is my duty to use my opportunity to ensure that every person everywhere gets their fair opportunity to pursue their American dream whether that's my special needs brother or it's me who will have opportunities he will never be able to dream to have. We all have our path in life and our purpose and we all should be able to pursue that with dignity. That is the essence of Tikkun Olam and that is the essence of uh, justice, justice thou shalt pursue, the fundamental code of the, the Jewish people. And so thank you for having me today. Thank you, David B. Uh, thank you to the JDCA for hosting uh, today's forum and thank you to everyone for tuning in my background in science, economics, government, and tax law has prepared me to serve in Congress and represent the Lower Hudson Valley. I'm a serious legislator who defeated an incumbent Republican State Assembly member eight years ago and helped to build our Democratic Party here in Westchester. 
Nita Lowy's voice will be sorely missed from the national stage. Whoever replaces her can't be trying to learn how to legislate on the fly or not have a track record of speaking out on critical issues like the U.S.-Israeli relationship and anti-Semitism. I've written over 70 bills that have become law from authoring the law to expose Donald Trump's New York State tax returns to spearheading a state constitutional amendment to strip public officials of their taxpayer-funded pensions when convicted of corruption. This is no time for on-the-job training. It's a time for a tested leader who will deliver. I ask you to visit davidbucklerforcongress.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Asha. Yes, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful forum. Um, uh, I, I agree. There's no time for uh, on-the-job training. And in fact, um, I'm the one that actually has the leadership and experiences to continue uh, Congresswoman Nita Lowy's legacy and, and go beyond that. Um, why is that? I'm a professor in national security and foreign policy. I'm also a military officer in the Army Reserves. I understand the local issues, especially when it comes to hate. I'm an African-American woman, so this has been a big issue for me. And so I can definitely have that the, the connection on what we can do to uh, um, address that issue. So we have to vote for someone or support someone who is strong on both, uh, both foreign policy and domestic policy. And I can do that. I have the ability, I understand Washington. I'm no stranger to Washington. And we need someone again, who understands this, especially for the fact that we went from a crisis to a crisis. That's a key reminder. We definitely need someone who can definitely uh, legislate who all understands both our issues in the local community as well as our understand the what's going on in the world. So that those are two aspects that we definitely need moving forward. And I am the best one. Thank you. Thank you, David C. Well, thank you. Thank you for putting this together. I want to thank the Jewish Democratic Council of America, and I want again I want to thank the candidates uh, for a great debate. Look, I'm David Carlucci. And some people ask, they say, David Carlucci, what, that, that's not Jewish, is it? Well, I was raised Catholic and later in life uh, got bar mitzvahed in, in Israel uh, during birthright. And so I call myself a pizza bagel. And I think it epitomizes really what is New York State. We're 19 and a half million people from every corner of the globe. And the 17th Congressional District is really a microcosm of that. I've stood with our brothers and sisters to make sure that uh, the Haitians that are here under temporary protective status can stay here, uh, to make sure that we had kosher food allocated by the state of New York during the COVID crisis, uh, to work with my brothers and sisters to make sure that we have a patient advocacy program in our hospitals to meet the unique needs, the kosher restrictions that people have, the, the dialects, the, the language barrier. Um, is that it? What's Josh doing down there? I'll explain in a moment. Thank you, David C. And please, DavidCarlucci.com. Thank you. I'm keeping my eye on you, Senator. That's, that's, Thank you. that's what I'm watching. Evelyn. So our district and our nation are experiencing multiple simultaneously occurring crises. And at the same time, we are losing this trailblazing, powerful woman at the head, from the head of our, de our delegation practically in New York, but the head certainly of the House Appropriations Committee. And we need to make sure that we pass the baton to someone with experience in managing crises, in legislating at the federal level. I have that experience. I helped President Obama in the White House Situation Room manage multiple crises. I was executive director of the WMD Commission, which among other things made recommendations on pandemics. And for seven years, as I said, I worked as a senior staffer on the Senate Armed Services Committee, drafting and passing legislation. I know what to do. I know how to do it. And furthermore, I will go in there in the spirit and tradition of Nita Lowy, not only sharing her policy views, but also conducting myself as she has done when it comes to constituent services with listening with empathy and with true attention to detail so i hope that i can get your vote on her before june 23rd thank you allison thank you very much and thank you to the jdca for hosting this wonderful forum uh this afternoon i have been a local leader in my community my entire life I am past president of Temple Beth Abraham, where I chaired our effort to move from dues to donations. And this is the one forum that will truly understand um, how, what a big deal that was, the first in Westchester to do that. I'm the founder of the Network of Elected Women to support women elected at municipal levels. Uh, on the national level, I'm past chair of NARAL, Pro-Choice America Foundation. 
and I helped to create the field of online activism. We have never been in this moment in time in our country. We have such enormous economic and social issues right now. And the one thing we don't need is business as usual, politicians as usual, or government staffers as usual. I am the only candidate here who is not career government, career politician. I have a practiced, very successful career as a leader, and I hope to take that to DC. Thank you. Thanks to all of you, all seven candidates, uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts on all these critically important issues driving the Jewish vote. Thanks to the more than 170 of you who tuned in today. And we'll see this uh, in the future because we'll share the video widely. I will now turn it over to JDCA's New York based board member, Josh Blasto, uh, to close our forum today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all. Can everyone hear me OK? Good to go? OK, great. Um, so thank you all for participating today. Some of you I had the privilege of working with in, in state government uh, over the years and just to see the committed public servants on the screen today, such as it is, you know, gives me hope for the future at NY17, which is such an important district. Uh, Congresswoman Lowy represented our values at JDCA across the board, both for protecting the state of Israel, um, but also our progressive values. And, the rights and equality of all people um, in the United States. So I, 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 I was very impressed and very pleased with what I saw during the discussion today and I'm looking forward to the future. Uh, just to acknowledge everyone, thank you, Assemblywoman Buck Buckwald, Ms. Castleberry Hernandez, Senator Carlucci, Dr. Farkas, Ms. Fine, Mr. Jones, and Mr. Schleifer uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, a, a personal and huge thank you to JDCA's political chair, Izzy Klein, and former Schumer colleague of mine, um, for helping plan and promote the panel, as well as my fellow JDCA board members from New York, Susie Stern and Karen Kasner, uh, for helping to organize this really important event in such an important primary in, in a district that's critical to our future. Uh, and thanks to everyone for uh, logging in and participating. This is how campaigns are operating these days, uh, and, and, and participation in the process is so important in New York. Just a reminder, early voting has already begun. I have cast my ballot in Manhattan. Uh, and voting ends on June 23rd. Uh, we hope that after tonight you're energized to vote in this critically important primary. Uh, just as a plug for our organization, JDCA has some great opportunities to engage in the coming weeks and months to ensure that Democrats are elected in November, which is our mission. Uh, we ultimately want to make sure that uh, Democrats up and down the ballot are, take back uh, seats across the country. Uh, please check out our website, jewishdems.org. And now uh, we invite you to join our national weekly national phone bank and text banks. We'll be calling and texting in swing states every Wednesday from 5.30 to 8.30 um, from now until November. You can learn about more about these actions and other volunteer opportunities, including our specific state chapters, again, at jewishdems.org. Uh, thank you all again. Stay safe, vote, uh, support JDCA, and we look forward to working with you uh, to elect Democrats across the country in November. Uh, a pleasure and a privilege. And uh, to the candidates, good luck. Um, in the coming weeks. Thank you all. Thank you.